Last December, biodiversity entered the spotlight with global community at the COP15 reaching the latest global biodiversity framework under the presidency of China. It sends a signal of hope for averting the worst scenarios and of course the real test will be in its implementation. I sat down with COP15 President Wang Renqiu for the story of brokering the deal. The COP15 Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework has established global biodiversity conservation goals for the next 10 to 30 years, as well as the necessary measures for achieving these goals. What is the rationale and, and consideration behind setting four long-term goals and 23 action-oriented global targets? It can be said that the international community has gone through four years of challenging negotiations, a kind of marathon, and we have achieved the ambitious yet pragmatic Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. The framework with its 2050 vision of harmonious coexistence between human and nature has set the goal of restoring global biodiversity by 2030. To achieve this, it outlines the implementation of targets at three levels, ecosystems, species, and genetic diversity, emphasizing the need for practical measures to achieve biodiversity conservation. This rationale serves as the foundation for the design of the four long-term goals by 2050 under the framework. In the past three years, the global economy has been confronted by risks due to COVID-19 and geopolitical challenges. Many countries have shifted their focus to their own economic recovery and development. The willingness of previous donor countries, namely developed countries, to contribute is waning. This also affects the investment in the ecological conservation of developing countries. In this context, at COP15, we try to be as free as possible from the narrow calculus of interests and free from political interference. We have reached a historic agreement on the well-being of all mankind, embodying the spirit of multilateralism. It has brought hope to the world by defining a clear path to its realization in the areas of finance, technology and capacity building. It goes far beyond biodiversity itself and has greatly boosted the international community's confidence in multilateralism. China's role at COP15 has shifted from a contracting party to a presidency country. Minister Huang has shared with me his memorable moments from the difficult process of reaching the framework. Frankly speaking, I have been under pressure as the president of the COP15, but it is encouraging to see that with the strong support and cooperation of the international community, China has accomplished this shift very well. Since assuming the presidency of COP15, the Chinese government has been promoting the COP15 process with the strongest political will and practical actions. President Xi Jinping has emphasized COP15 more than 10 times in important bilateral and multilateral diplomatic settings since 2019. In 2021 and 2022, he attended the first and second phases of the conference via video and announced China would contribute 1.5 billion Chinese yuan to establish the Kunming Biodiversity Fund, putting forward four propositions to strengthen global biodiversity protection bringing strong political impetus for the success of the COP15. Since the first phase of the conference, China has made full use of some important occasions and opportunities, such as the leaders' dialogue of the United Nations High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development and the 27th United Nations Climate Change Conference, to fully communicate and coordinate with senior representatives from various countries to promote successful convening of the second phase of the conference. During the critical moment of the negotiations, we set up three coordination groups for negotiations on key issues led by ministers from Egypt and Canada, Chile and Norway, and Rwanda and Germany. They mobilized the enthusiasm of parties to resolve conflicts one by one and unify understanding. Well, a Kunming Mantra Global Biodiversity Framework proposes to protect 30% of the world's land and sea areas by 2030. And given the different ecological and environmental protection potentials of different countries, what efforts should the international community make to achieve this goal? 
The long-term inaction goes in the Kunming Montreal Biodiversity Framework are global goals, not national. Countries can make their contribution to achieving the global goals according to the national priorities and capacities. The experience of the IHG biodiversity targets over the past decade shows that the reason for the failure to achieve the goals for protected areas is not because the targets lack ambitions, but it was due to the difficulties and challenges in the implementation. The majority of biodiversity-rich countries are developing countries, and the financial and human resources available for protected area establishment and management are far from matching their conservation needs. In order to prevent the protected area targets from becoming empty talk of parks on paper, the Kunming framework emphasizes the accessibility of the targets. We need to balance the relationship between conservation and sustainable use use of biodiversity. Data show that fish constitutes 17 percent of the global population's protein intake, and for people living in coastal zones and islands, this percentage is higher. Ensuring the protein intake of coastal and island populations is also relevant to achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals 2, 3, and 14. It suggests that marine conservation should be emphasized in tandem with sustainable use. Protected areas are not no man land nor a vacuum for development. We should balance the relationship between biodiversity protection and sustainable use developed through protection and truly realize the harmonious coexistence between man and nature. Uh, the second phase of COP15 has historically included digital sequence information on genetic resources, or DSI, in the framework, which has attracted much attention worldwide. What exactly is DSI, and how can we promote its implementation further? DSI means Digital Sequence Information on Genetic Resources. In simple terms, it refers to the digitized form of genetic resources. With the rapid development of technologies such as gene sequencing and synthetic biology, utilization of genetic resources in the fields of life science and biotechnology has gradually shifted towards the use of DSI. Therefore, there is the issue of cost or benefit sharing related to DSI. Throughout negotiations at previous COP conferences, it has consistently been a challenging matter. Developed and developing countries hold different perspectives, since the countries use DSI and those that provide it have huge disagreements. Those countries providing DSI strongly demand the resolution of this issue and put high expectations on it. During the second phase of the COP15 meeting, we reached a preliminary consensus on the acquisition and benefit sharing of DSI. On the one hand, the goal of fair and equitable use of DSI has been required in Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. On the other hand, a roadmap was developed to address the benefit sharing of DSI. First, all parties agreed to establish a multilateral mechanism for DSI benefit sharing, including a global fund. Second, to establish an ad hoc technical expert group to discuss and determine operation model of the multilateral mechanism. Third, to formally clarify establishment and operation of the multilateral mechanism at COP16 and assess its effectiveness at COP18. Fourth, to form a list of issues need to be further discussed in the future. In this case, the COP15 meeting has historically incorporated DSI into Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, or rather the parties have partially addressed the issue of fair and equitable use of DSI. Well, let's talk about funding. Funding is a core issue. Uh, discussions to amount of parties focus on how much funding developed countries should provide to developing countries to address biodiversity loss. The financial targets and resource mobilization strategies proposed by the framework have attracted much attention since they are related to the realization of the goal as expected. Could you brief us on the funding situation and suggest ways to encourage developed countries to fulfill their commitments? 
In international negotiations, especially those concerning environmental issues, reaching consensus on funding is extremely rare and a significant success. The Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework proposes to gradually narrow the global biodiversity financing gap of 700 billion US dollars per year, including reducing harmful subsidies. By 2030, it is required to eliminate, phase out, or reform. Those incentives, including subsidies that are detrimental to biodiversity, should be reduced by 500 billion US dollars annually. Furthermore, there is a need to increase the mobilization of resources, aiming at raising at least 200 billion US dollars per year by 2030. Funding for biodiversity conservation flowing from developed countries to developing countries should reach a minimum of 20 billion US dollars annually by 2025 and at least 30 billion US dollars annually by 2030. This allocation is considered as an important source of public funds. The COP15 conference adopted a new resource mobilization strategy and established a resource mobilization committee authorizing the Global Environment Facility to establish the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework Fund this year. China will contribute 1.5 billion Chinese yuan to establish the Kunming Biodiversity Fund, supporting the development of biodiversity conservation in developing countries. Well, looking ahead, what goals and plans does China have for its own biodiversity conservation and its participation in global biodiversity governance? China is promoting the establishment of a natural conservation system primarily based on national parks. We set up the ecological conservation red line system. We give special attention and protection to areas with extremely important and sensitive ecological functions by designating them as ecological conservation red line areas, which is unique worldwide. The area covered by our red lines exceeds 30% of our national territory. We are actively studying and planning specialized legislation in the field of national biodiversity to promote the conservation of wildlife and plants, as well as the revision of laws and regulations in areas such as nature reserves in order to strengthen the legal framework for biodiversity governance. From agreement to action, build back biodiversity is the theme of this year's International Day for Biological Diversity on May 22nd. This theme expresses the commitment of all parties to transform consensus into action and work together to create a new global blueprint for biodiversity conservation.